I'm Pete. I'm Stephanie, and this is The Cool Part Show, our show all about innovative, unique 3D printed parts. This is a 3D printed spine implant made of polymer, not metal, and it's been approved by the FDA. It's also our first implant to be featured on the show that is made through an extrusion style 3D printing process. Fused strand deposition of peak on this episode of The Cool Parts Show. This episode of The Cool Part Show is brought to you by Carpenter Additive. We're at the company's powder production facility in Athens, Alabama. Specifically, we are standing on top of the Z1, the company's largest vacuum atomizer for producing metal powders. Want to know how to make metal powder for additive manufacturing? Stick around after the episode. Welcome to The Cool Parts Show. Thank you for joining us. If you like the show, hit that subscribe button to get notified about our new episodes. Today, we're gonna to be talking about this 3D printed cervical spine implant. This is an FDA approved device and it's made from peak polyether ether ketone. So in other words, it's a polymer. We have covered 3D printed spine implants in articles on additivemanufacturing.media, even on the Cool Parts show. But those 3D printed implants have been made of metal, made of titanium, and produced through powder bed fusion. This spine implant tells a very different story. This is a polymer, and it was made through a different process. It was made through a deposition style 3D printing process, a variation on fused filament fabrication. So different process, different material, and the exact material is important here too. So PEAK is a semi-crystalline polymer. It's a thermoplastic, so you can heat it up, mold it, print it, manipulate it in various different ways. But as it cools, it forms this crystalline microstructure that gives it some interesting material properties. So to talk about why PEAK is so good for implants in particular, I want to introduce Todd Reith. Todd is the Vice President of Emergent Technologies and Additive Manufacturing at Curativa, which is the company that makes these implants. Peak has a long history of being used for implants. It's a safe and biocompatible material used for over 30 years. The material is radiolucent. Surgeons can precisely monitor the patient post-op. The implant's totally transparent, making it possible to see the bone integrate with the implant. The modulus is nearly one-to-one -to, -one to human bone, and the implant bears the weight like natural bone would, which reduces the likelihood of adjacent stress shielding. So PEAK has great properties. It has stiffness that matches that of human bone. It is radiolucent, meaning it's invisible to x-rays. But there are challenges. Starting here, PEAK is not a bioactive material. Curativa had to deal with that. To talk about that, here is Curativa's Eric Irby, who is chief science officer. The PEAK material is traditionally hydrophobic, meaning it repels is not loving of water. To make it hydrophilic, one of the things we've done is to apply a nano coating of hydroxyapatite. This becomes important because this is done after we print the part. So it gets on every surface, every interstice, up in every single pore. That liquid is evaporated off and then nano crystals of hydroxyapatite with the needle-like morphology are adhered very strongly to the surface of the implant inside and out, all throughout, these nanohydroxyapatite crystals not only makes it hydrophilic, but drives a reaction that forms bone that is known as immunomodulation. So that coating is the way that Curativa got around Peak's hydrophobic properties. But there are some other hurdles to clear here too. Maybe the most interesting is that Peak is kind of a tricky material to 3D print with. Here's the issue. With Peak, the melt temperature and the crystallization temperature are far apart. That means the normal method of deposition style 3D printing, melting material and laying it down, just wasn't gonna work. Printing Peak has many pitfalls. The delta between the glass transition, T of G, and the melt temperature, M of G, is over 200 degrees Celsius. T of G is roughly around 140 degrees Celsius, and M of G is approximately 350 degrees Celsius. It's critical to manage the thermal history during the printing process to prevent locking the peak in an amorphous state versus a more desirable crystalline state. Our patented technology precisely targets the necessary heat at the active deposition layer during the extrusion. Without controlling some of the thermal history when printing peak, the peak can be locked in this amorphous state, and that'll create this amber to translucent uh, brown 
streaking within the, the layers and also minimizes the mechanical strength on your Z layer bond. And so a semi-crystalline state will be the natural opaque off-white color, which you'll see consistently through the construct in a finished printed device. So the specific 3D printing method that they're using is called fused strand deposition. Fused strand deposition. So normal deposition style 3D printing, like fused filament fabrication, kind of like working with a glue gun. Uh, the material is melted and it is extruded in that melted form, build up the part layer by layer that way. With fused strand deposition, it is much more like working with strands of taffy, knitting the part together with these taffy strands. The material is not melted all the way. It is in this amorphous crystalline state. And as, as you look closely at an implant made this way, you can kind of see the taffy strand-like structures, the way that the layers are built out of strands like that, certainly the way the bone ingrowth geometry, the sort of Lattice geometry is made that way. Um, getting to a, a process that could build apart this way, that's what was involved in the invention of a new deposition process. In fused strand deposition, it works really well with PEAK because it's a path-dependent material. So the way that you manipulate the polymer during 3D printing is going to have an impact on that crystallinity on the ultimate material properties. FSD is a way of controlling that directionality as well as controlling the, the cooling of the, the material. We figured out how to control that, that thermal history in terms of depositing this layer by layer. And you may hear in the literature about Z layer bonding. As you can imagine, a 3D printed part has an X and Y layer in the two dimensional plane. But as you build that three dimensional part, that's the Z layer. And if those subsequent layers, any one of them could be uh, a site for a defect or a delamination. So, the critical control of that deposition in fused filament fabrication is really where we get a leg up in controlling our final structure property uh, relationships. You, you see a lot of clearance of implants that are compression molded that may have some interconnected porosity. That's not the same peak as one that's been built layer by layer in an additive manufacturing sense because each layer can be put in compression and can be a toughening and strengthening mechanism. There's a good bit of literature out there showing that, that even the strength of peak can be taken to a much higher level depending on its crystallinity and its thermal history. Those things inherently affect our ultimate strength properties. And so we achieved a compressive strength six times what is required for physiologic loads and two to four times any implant that's on the market. It's indeed because of this 3D printing approach. So this printing process is a really good match for Peak's material properties. And by 3D printing these implants one at a time, Curativa can precisely control that thermal history. They can get the crystallinity and that compressive strength that they're after. So this particular spine implant made it all the way through. Fully developed, uh, fully validated, approved by the FDA. But it took a while. The FDA had a lot of questions. This was not your typical FDA 510K process. Uh, traditionally, review is within 90 days to six months. Curativa's approval process required 18 months, um, which was significantly longer than most um, other submissions. The FDA required more time to fully understand our manufacturing process. And fused strand deposition is one of the few only methods that avoids many of those concerns. We collaborated very closely with the FDA, and we had extensive studies and additional performance data to mitigate many of those issues. There's still a lot of questions about what are we getting with the final products from additive manufacturing? What are the challenges? Where are the areas that need improvement? And so we know about these materials, titanium and peak, but what we don't know is how these materials perform when they've been assembled in this way, in this, this layer by layer additive manufacturing. And so the 18 months was a lot of us responding to their questions, thinking of other tests that we could do. So here's an example of a test. These little metal pins in here, they're there for location. The implant is invisible to x-ray, so when the patient is being x-rayed after the implant has been put in, these metal pins help the physician see exactly where the implant is. But 
the FDA wondered, were these metal pins secretly actually helping with the high compressive strength that this implant had? So, Curativa 3D printed other test versions that had no metal pins in it to evaluate that question. We want you to test this without your metal markers in there. They might be strengthening it. Or we want you to do testing above and beyond what those uh, standards call for. Now, of course, we were a little concerned about doing so, but we did. And in fact, our mechanical properties didn't change, which demonstrates to us that our Z-layer bonding and our control of our internal structures is really quite robust. And the mechanical strength and the, the process uh, qualification demonstrate a very, very tight process. A fully controlled process had to be demonstrated. We created a dashboard for real-time data monitoring and all critical to build parameters were collected. A full IQ, OQ, and PQ validation was performed. All process controls were calibrated, controlled, monitored, and recorded. As pioneers of this technology, we had to establish a set of guidelines to ensure a repeatable controlled methodology was in place, which the FDA eventually approved. Getting that FDA approval was really exciting for Curativa. So this allowed them to go into production with this cervical spine implant. And now that they've been through this process, now there's a pathway for other implants made from this material and made through this kind of weird manufacturing process. The next time they want to get something through FDA approval, it should go a lot faster. So we have some other examples of things that they're working on. These are different types of spine cages for lower lumbar conditions, uh, wedges for foot and ankle surgeries. Um, they're even playing around with some different types of infill patterns like you can see in these tibial spacers. And as implants like these become available, become approved, Curativa will be ready to produce them. So the, the process, the manufacturing workflow has all been worked out with this implant and Curativa is equipping a production facility in Huntsville, Alabama that will mass produce 3D printed peak implants using the company's proprietary process. The process itself is very scalable. So we've already got a, a dozen printers made. We have a clean room space that will allow us to put up to 30 and more than enough address our capacity needs. And since we have all our instrument sets uh, developed and built in house, uh, there should be no delay in launching a fuller uh, set of not only cervical, but lumbar inner body implants. All right, I think we got this. All right. 3D printed spine implant made of peak, peak valuable because of its stiffness matching human bone and also because of its invisibility to x-ray. This is a cervical spine implant made by Curativa. They use a process called fused strand deposition, which is similar to FFF, except that you are actually sort of like stretching the material as you're depositing it, uh, pulling these taffy strands and creating the geometry of these parts. First implant has gone through FDA approval, cleared FDA approval. It took a while, not just because the material is different, but also because the process is so different. But now that it has been approved, there is a pathway for future 3D printed peak implants. If you like the show, let us know in the comments below and make sure to subscribe to get notified about new episodes. Also take a look at our back catalog. We have lots of past episodes of The Cool Part Show about different types of 3D printed implants as well as tons of other cool parts. We love ideas for future episodes. If you have a cool 3D printed part, if you're working on something, we'd love to hear about it. Cool parts at additivemanufacturing.media. Thanks for watching. This episode's brought to you by Carpenter Additive. We are at the company's powder production facility in Athens, Alabama, and we are standing on top of an atomizer. The Z1 is Carpenter Technologies' largest vacuum atomizer, and it is the heart of the process for making additive manufacturing metal powder here at Carpenter Additive. This facility is capable of producing up to 18,000 pounds of metal powder per day. Plant manager Jordan Ralph talked us through the process. So an atomizer is a piece of equipment that uh, is capable of melting and pouring molten metal into the stream of high pressure um, gas uh, that turns that molten metal into tiny, tiny droplets that ultimately cool and form uh, our powder, which looks like uh, gray dust. So to start our process and the uh, ultimate end-to-end -end solution that we have here, 
Um, we bring in raw materials um, all the way down to individual elements, so nickel, cobalt, chrome, um, moly, niobium. We bring all of those raw materials into the shop. We utilize those materials uh, to build charges that go into the uh, atomizer. Um, as you walk that flow path, you run through uh, our charge makeup area uh, where all of the materials are weighed out um, in very exact uh, quantities. Uh, that ensures that we're able to hit our customer specifications uh, and hold the tight tolerances that we're looking for on a chemistry perspective. Um, from there, the material is flown to the top of the atomizer and charged into the furnace. As the material is produced, it's poured out and is collected at the bottom of the atomizer. Uh, the material is then uh, taken and transferred into a bulk container uh, for processing through the rest of the uh, value stream. The next stop for any of our as atomized powder would be uh, the screener. Uh, so that will remove the coarse portion of the uh, um, powder. Uh, from there, we take it through air classification. It takes the fine portion of the uh, particle size distribution out and makes the uh, final cut for uh, an additive material, like a 10 to 45. From there, we stack up all of those individual lots and put them into the 12,000 pound blender uh, to make the single homogeneous blends. Um, at that point, we are able to pack in any configuration that the customer is looking for, whether that be drums, bottles, um, powder trace hoppers. Really, we've got a lot, of, a lot of options to meet customers' needs there. The atomization capability and all of the powder um, capabilities gives us a unique um, you know, position where we're actually able to uh, produce the powder, run testing uh, through additive machines, all the way through hip and heat treat, um, do final testing on those products and then make additional changes or um, try to optimize, you know, things like our uh, chemistry or sizing so that we uh, ultimately can uh, serve our customers better.